time. Before we had wristwatches, we used enormous clocks on towers to mark its passage. Before we had those, we used bells. Even earlier still, hourglasses. Before hourglasses, there were water clocks. But what are water clocks exactly? And before water clocks, we used sundials. And by that I mean shadows and back even further. Before sundials, we relied on the movement of the sun and the moon. In this video, we're going to travel through time together and see how the way we measure it has changed. Ciao ragazzi, this video was written and filmed in Italian by our team of scientists, storytellers and video makers, manually translated into English, but, but, dubbed with artificial intelligence. Long live culture and let's go back to the video. At the start of the Homo sapiens epoch, the passing of time was marked by sunrises and sunsets. It was the visible motion of the sun and the moon that guided all daily activities. In short, the biological cycle of human beings and the cycle of nature were in total harmony, and to some extent that's still the case. Light and darkness still guide us, however, at a certain point in our history, this was no longer enough. There was a concrete need to use instruments to measure time, and this arose from a practical necessity. In fact, it coincided with the Neolithic Agricultural Revolution, which took place between 10,000 and 8,000 BC. During this period, humans transitioned from hunting and gathering to a lifestyle based on agriculture and sedentism. In other words, they began to accumulate food and resources. For this reason, it was important to learn to measure time more accurately, also because it would enable them to predict periods of drought or land fertility, which were crucial for planting and harvesting. It's very likely that this is how the first calendars came into being. Calendars are conventional, they are human constructs. They are often connected with religious beliefs, foundation myths, or the demands of a changing earth. In fact, even today there are a number of different ones, but we'll come to that in a moment. It was the same in antiquity, where calendars were based on local beliefs and needs. The ancient Egyptians, for example, had a calendar that was based entirely on agricultural activities. And in fact, the calendar started on the exact day when the flooding of the Nile reached the city of Memphis, which is known today as MIT Rahina. Agriculture was so fundamental that the year was divided up according to the cycle of the Nile because it was what made the land fertile. So there were three seasons of four months. The season of the flood, the season of the land emerging from the waters, and the season of the harvest. And then, at some point, the week was created. We're in Mesopotamia, in Babylon during Hammurabi's reign. It's 1800 BC, and it is here that they first start marking time in weeks based around days dedicated to sacred events. A bit like our Sunday in Western countries, or Shabbat, which is Saturday in the Jewish tradition. But how was this time measured? The oldest time measuring instrument ever documented is a sundial from ancient Egypt from around 1500 BC. And it was a revolution, an ingenious way to mark the passing of time by observing the sun just as before, but this time utilizing its shadows. At that time, it was about using the shadow of a stick or a rod to understand how much time was left until nightfall. Basically, the sun's position causes the shadow to move across a sort of clock face, telling you what time it is. Around the same period, hourglasses were also invented. We imagine them like this, right? With sand. However, in the beginning, they didn't contain sand. It was originally water that flowed inside them, as the name clepsydra, as they are known in Italian, suggests. It comes from the Greek term clepsydra in English, in which kleps means to steal and hydra means water. The oldest hourglass we know of, the Karnak hourglass, dates back to between 1390 and 1350 BC. And it was indeed water-based, and guess what? It was always an ancient Egyptian work. And then came the revolution. The day gets divided into 24 hours, each hour into 60 minutes, and each minute into 60 seconds. The first to organize time in the way we know it today, even after centuries, were always the Babylonians. But how did this division of time come about? Because 60 and 24 might, at first glance, seem like almost random numbers. Why not 25? Why not 80? 
Well, these numbers come partly from the observation of the stars and the sky and partly from human logic. That a year lasted about 365 days had already been determined in antiquity from the movement of the sun, and that this year was composed of 12 months was not coincidental. It derives from the lunar cycles, of which there are indeed 12. The number 12 has always had a certain importance, certainly because of this fact about the moon, but probably also due to its mathematical properties. It's a number that has lots of divisors, 2, 3, 4, 6. Already in 2150 BC, the ancient Egyptians had begun dividing the daytime up into 12 equal parts, and they did the same for the nighttime, getting 24 hours per day. The Hebrew calendar then made its appearance. It was most likely adopted between the 7th and 6th centuries BC, a period known as the Babylonian captivity, and year one of the Hebrew calendar coincides with our 3761 BC. This is because, for them, that was the year the world was created. Well, now we come to the water clocks of the 3rd century BC. The water clock, or Clepsydra, of Tisibius, a famous Greek engineer and inventor, is very well known. It worked precisely thanks to the flow of water through a mechanism of containers, pistons, and toothed wheels. And here we are in the first century BC, when the Julian calendar of ancient Rome first appears. Year one of this calendar corresponds to our 753 BC. According to Roman mythology, the calendar, which was already composed of 12 months, was established by Romulus himself on the occasion of Rome's founding. In reality, the birth date of the city, 753 BC, was actually established later, during the Republican period under the government of Julius Caesar, from whom the name of the calendar is derived. Interesting fact, while we have BC, before Christ, and AD Anno Domini, the Julian calendar referred to dates as pre-foundation and post-foundation. Any date, in fact, was expressed with the famous phrase ab urb condita, meaning from the founding of the city. We now come to hourglasses, but this time they do actually contain sand. These hourglasses didn't need to be constantly refilled, as water clocks did, so they were literally portable. And while this one doesn't actually fit in my pocket, you could carry them around and thus keep track of time. And there's a substantial difference between sand and water, making them much more practical. Water can undergo changes of state, such as freezing or evaporating, which affects the time it can measure. Sand, on the other hand, does not have this problem. This led to the enormous success of sand hourglasses. However, there is less clarity concerning their invention compared to the original water version. According to some scholars, they too were created by the ancient Egyptians, while other hypotheses suggest they are a much later invention, the work of French monks during the early Middle Ages, between 476 and 1000 AD. Here we are. After thousands of years of evolution, we've reached the instrument that measures the passage of time in our modern-day lives, the clock. This word derives from the German term Glock, which actually means bell. Yes, because for centuries in Europe, the bells of churches and monasteries were what informed people of the passing of time throughout the day. At the end of the Middle Ages, on those very same bell towers and other city towers, the first enormous clocks appeared, and they were true works of art. A few centuries later, the calendar that we're all familiar with and which is still used by the majority of the world's population comes into being. It's the Gregorian calendar, which is based on the Julian calendar, but with Pope Gregory XIII's modifications. It's now 1582. However, the concept of BC and AD didn't originate with Pope Gregory XIII. It already existed. Dionysius Exiguus, a Catholic monk, had introduced it a thousand years earlier. Basically, our year one had been identified a long time previously, in 525 AD, while our calendar was formally established in 1582. Continuing with our journey through time and returning to clocks, we will have to wait until the end of the 17th century for the minute hand to appear on clocks and shortly thereafter, the smaller one for seconds. You have to consider that Galileo Galilei, who lived between the 16th and 17th centuries, still used his heartbeat to measure time during his experiments. But the clock boom truly arrived with the Industrial Revolution, meaning between 1760 and 1840 AD. 
This is when time becomes indispensable for all aspects of life, and it is also now easily available and the same for everyone. By the end of the 19th century, clocks were installed in factories and public places, then in homes, and finally they were in the pockets and on the wrists of thousands of people. Since then, a lot has changed. Clocks have become increasingly precise and more of an accessory. Nowadays, clocks are of progressively less practical use. Most of us check the time on our phones. By the way, it's time to say goodbye. Guys and girls, as usual, thanks for watching up to this point. I hope you enjoyed this video, and I look forward to seeing you for the next video, always here on Geopop Everyday Science.